Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone, welcome to the week four lecture. Last week we looked at describing distributions for single variables and we looked at writing reports on those. We looked at the one sample t test and we looked at the binomial test. This week we'll be looking at sampling distributions and the theory behind hypothesis tests like that binomial test and that one sample t test we dealt with last week. It might take a while for the theory to fall into place for you. It's quite a difficult concept to understand fully. But if you give it time and you work through the sampling simulations you'll find on Blackboard, it should start to make sense for you. You'll have a much better idea of what hypothesis tests are all about and what they can and can't tell you if you've got some understanding of the sampling theory that they're built on. So before we start with sampling theory, let's just do a brief review of last week's work. And we'll start with the one sample t-test. Now a one sample t-test is for a metric variable and the essential idea is that we're comparing the mean in our sample to some fixed or reference mean. And in the example we were looking at last week, we were comparing the mean time spent watching TV per day in a sample of university students to a reference mean of 3.2 hours per day. And that was the mean time spent watching TV for Australians in general. So looking at the one sample t-test output down here, here's our reference mean. 3.2 hours was the mean time spent watching television by Australians in general. The mean in our sample was just over 0.8 hours longer than this. So this mean difference here is the difference between the test or the reference mean and the mean in the sample. We want to know whether the difference between the mean in our sample and the reference mean is big enough to convince us that all university students, on average, watch more TV per day than Australians in general. This is what the t-test and its associated p-value tells us. If the p-value is less than 0 0.050, then we can say that the test is statistically significant. There's enough evidence to convince us that on average, university students watch more than 3.2 hours of TV per day. Here our p-value is tiny, 0 0.000. And a lot of people think that 0 0.000 means absolutely zero. But it's not exactly zero. It might be something like 0 0.00004, which when we round off, gives us 0 0.000 to three decimal places. So when we report a p-value of 0 0.000, we always give it as p less than 0 0.001. It's not actually zero. Now that particular value is definitely less than 0 0.050, so this test is significant. So let's have a look at the structure of the report. We always start the report with a brief introduction. And that introduction sets the scene and gives any specific hypothesis or research question that we have. Here we've phrased it as a research question, whether university students spend more time watching te television than Australians in general. But we could just as well have given a hypothesis here, not a research question. Notice that our research question is about the population. It's about all Australian university students. The next part of the report, we give some information about the sample. So we say what sort of people were in the sample, that would be Australian university students. We say how many there were, 444. And we give the mean of our variable, the mean time spent watching television was 4.04 hours per day, and the standard deviation, 1.51 hours. Next, we explicitly compare our sample mean to that reference mean that we're interested in. So this is more than the average of 3.2 hours per day recorded for Australians in general. Then we say what sort of a test we used. It was a one sample t-test. And we comment that the difference in the mean time is significant. So we have to back up that statement about significance with the appropriate statistics. And you'll see here we report the degrees of freedom. That's coming from here in the output. We report the actual value of the t statistic, 11.67, and that's coming from here in the output. And we report the p-value, p less than 0 0.001. Next, we interpret the 95% confidence interval. Now, you need to be really careful with how you express this. The 95% confidence interval is talking about the population, all university students. So you need to be sure that your interpretation doesn't sound like you're talking about the sample. So, for example, if you said the 95% confidence interval indicates that the university students watched between 0.7 and 0.98 hours more TV, it would sound like you were just discussing the students who took part in the study 
not the population of all university students. Finally, we have to finish with the conclusion. So here we're explicitly relating our findings back to the original hypothesis. Again, notice that you've got to be very careful with the language here. If you said the university student spent more time watching TV than Australians in general, it would sound like you were just discussing the 444 students in the sample, not all university students. So here we've said, as suggested, university students spend more time watching television than Australians in general. And then it's clear that we're talking about the population of all university students. So now let's have a look at the binomial test. Binomial tests are relevant to categorical data. We use binomial tests to compare the percentage or the proportion in the sample to some known or reference percentage or proportion. In this case, we're comparing the percentage of Australians who've travelled overseas in our sample to the reference percentage, 25% who travelled overseas in 2010. So we can see that in our sample, 35% or 0.35 had travelled overseas in the last 12 months. This is our observed proportion. And we're comparing that to the test proportion, our reference proportion of 0.25. That's the percentage of Australians who travelled overseas in 2010. So we can see that our sample proportion is higher than the reference proportion. But maybe that difference was just chance. Maybe we just happened to choose a well-travelled sample. What we want to know is if the percentage in our sample is high enough to convince us that the percentage of Australians travelling overseas has increased. And again, we do this by comparing the p-value to 0 0.050. If the p-value is less than 0 0.050, we say that the test is significant. So here, our p-value is 0 0.011 and that's less than 0 0.050, so the test is significant. We've got enough evidence to convince us that the percentage of Australians travelling overseas has increased. If you have a look at the structure for the binomial test, you can see it's just like the structure of the one sample t-test. We've started with an introduction, and here we've given a hypothesis that the percentage of Australians who travel overseas has increased since 2010. Then we go on and say something about what we found in the sample. So we talk about how big the sample was, 111. We say what kinds of people were in the sample, so it was adult Australians. And we give the sample percentage. 35% have travelled overseas in the past 12 months. And then we explicitly compare that sample percentage to the reference percentage. So this is higher than the percentage of Australians who travelled overseas in 2010, 25%. We say what sort of test was used, so a binomial test shows us that the difference is significant. So we have to be explicit that the difference is statistically significant. And we back that up with the appropriate statistics, which in the case of the binomial test is just the size of the sample and the p-value. Then we give the 95% confidence interval, and again we're very careful to phrase that 95% percent confidence interval so that it's clear we're talking about the population, not to the 111 Australians who were in our sample. So the 95% confidence interval indicates that between 26% and 44% of Australians have travelled overseas in the past 12 months. And finally, we finish with a conclusion that relates explicitly back to our original hypothesis. As expected, the percentage of Australians who travel overseas has increased since 2010. So this week, we're going to be looking at the theory behind significance testing. Not just the binomial test and the one sample t-test, but all of the significance tests that we're going to be looking at. First, let's have a look again at the p-values that we've been using. A p-value is a probability. It's the probability that if there was no difference in the population, we'd get a test statistic, like the t-value, as extreme as the one we've observed. Now, the background behind this is what we're going to build up in our discussion of sampling theory. The smaller the p-value, the less likely we'd be to see our particular sample if there was no difference or no relationship in the population. So the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence that there's a difference in the population. When we quote the p-value, we always give it to three decimal places. And most of the time, we'll give it exactly as it's given in the SPSS output. For example, p is 0 0.011 or p equals 0 0.020. The one exception to that is when SPSS gives a p-value of 0 
when we'll report p is less than 0 0.001. So the whole idea of sampling theory is that when we look at our sample, it's just one of a whole lot of different samples that we might have got when we took a sample from our population. If we took a whole heap of samples from our population, we wouldn't expect them to all be the same. And this difference between different samples is called sampling variability. So we're going to have a look at a specific example that relates to proportions. And we'll start with a hypothesis. Our hypothesis is that Jamaicans are less likely than Peruvians to have an MP3 player in their mobile phones. Now, let's suppose that in Peru they've got really good records and they know that 80% of mobile phones have an MP3 capability. But in Jamaica, they're a bit more laid back and they don't have the same extensive records as Peru. So if you want to check out our hypothesis, we're going to need to take a sample because we don't know what the proportion of mobile phones with MP3 players is in Jamaica. Suppose we took a random sample of mobile phones in Jamaica and we recorded if they had an MP3 player or not. Then we could calculate what proportion of phones in our sample had an MP3 player. Would we expect the proportion in our sample to be exactly the same as the proportion in the in the population? Uh, probably not. Some samples would have a lower proportion than the population and some would have a higher proportion. But if we had a reasonably large sample, we'd expect the proportion in our sample to be somewhere around the proportion in the population. So if the proportion of mobile phones with an MP3 player in our sample was somewhere around about 0.8, then maybe our hypothesis is wrong. Maybe in Jamaica the proportion of mobile phones with an MP3 player is around about 0.8, just like in Peru. On the other hand, if the proportion of mobile phones with an MP3 player in our sample was something like 0.3, then that would suggest that less than 80% of Jamaican mobile phones have an MP3 player. We'd have evidence to support our hypothesis. Now, all this is a bit vague, just how small would the proportion in our sample have to be before we were convinced that our hypothesis was true? To work this out, we need sampling theory. So we're going to start with an odd sort of proposition. We put up a straw man and we try and knock it down. What if the proportion of mobile phones with an MP3 player was exactly the same in Jamaica as it was in Peru? Now, in a lot of textbooks, you'll see that referred to as the null hypothesis. It's a language that we don't use very often in this unit, but it's nice to have heard it. If we took a whole heap of samples from a population where 80% of the mobile phones have an MP3 capability, like in Peru, what sorts of proportions would we expect to find in those samples? Then if we actually take one sample of Jamaicans and look to see whether it seems like it would fit with the samples we got from Peru, then if we took one sample of mobile phones from Jamaica, we could look to see whether that sample looked like it fitted with the sorts of samples we got from Peru. And if it didn't, it would suggest that the percentage of mobile phones with MP3 players is different in Jamaica to what it is in Peru. So let's start by taking a population where the proportion is 0.8, so that's our Peruvian mobile phones, and we'll take six samples of size 50 from that population. And in each of the samples, we'll have a look and see how many of the mobile phones had an MP3 player. Now, in the first one, there were 42 mobile phones with an MP3 player, and that's a proportion of 0.84. Then we take another sample of 50 mobile phones in Peru, and there were 39 mobile phones with an MP3 player, and that's a proportion of 0.78. And we keep going until we've taken six samples. And what you can see here is that each of the samples has a different proportion of phones with MP3 players in. So they're all falling somewhere around 0.8, the proportion of mobile phones in our Peruvian population. To get a better feel for how the sample proportions are distributed, it's helpful to look at them on a graph. So here's a graph, and let's take that first proportion, sample proportion of 0.84, and we'll plot that on our graph, we'll represent it as a box on our graph. And then we take the next one, 0.78, and show that on the graph, and then so on with each of the six sample proportions. And you can see they're all falling, roughly speaking, around the 0.8 mark. Some are a bit higher, some are a bit lower, 
some of them are right on point 8. So suppose we keep on taking more samples. That'll give us an idea of what kind of sample proportions we'd expect if the proportion in the population was point 8. So let's have a look at the kinds of sample proportions we'd get if we took 50 different samples. So here we go, we've built up a graph. It's a histogram of the proportions we found in each of our different samples. So each box on the graph here, each of these little squares, represents the proportion in one sample of 50 mobile phones in Peru. Now you can see that shape that we're starting to build up is looking just a little bit like a normal curve. It's fairly symmetric, yeah, it's quite close to that normal curve. If we keep taking more and more samples and plotting them on a histogram, then the distribution will look more and more like a normal distribution. And by the time we've taken 300 samples, we can see that we've got something that's quite close to a normal distribution. So this is what's known as the sampling distribution. It lets us see what sorts of sample proportions we'd expect if we took samples from the Peruvian population, where 80% of mobile phones had an MP3 player. You can see that the sample proportions are centered around 0.8 here, and that's the proportion in, our, in the population the samples were taken from. But in a, some of the samples, the proportions were lower than 0.7, and in other samples, the proportions were higher than 0.9. So there's a fair amount of variability going on from sample to sample. Suppose we took just one sample of 50 Jamaican phones. In our sample of 50 Jamaican phones, 30 of them had MP3 players. That's a proportion of 0.6. So we need to ask, does it look like our sample of Jamaican phones fits with the sorts of samples we got from the Peruvian population, where the proportion was 0.8? So let's see where this sample proportion would fit in the sampling distribution we produced for Peruvian phones. So here's our Peruvian sampling distribution. Our proportion of 0.6 would fit over here, right out to the left. So the Jamaican sample doesn't look like it fits here. Then none of the samples we took from the population where the proportion was 0.8 had a proportion as low as 0.6. So what we're saying here is that if the proportion of mobile phones with MP3 players was 0.8 in Jamaica, we'd be very unlikely to take a sample of 50 phones and get only 60% of them having an MP3 player. Our sample's not consistent with the sort of samples we'd get if the population proportion was 0.8. So what's that tell us? We turn it around a bit and we say if the population proportion was 0.8 we'd be unlikely to get this sample proportion. So we're pretty convinced that the population proportion is not 0.8, it's probably lower than 0.8. So what we've been doing here is setting up an empirical sampling distribution. The process of taking lots and lots of samples and plotting the proportion in each one works okay, but it's really tedious. So fortunately we don't have to set up our sampling distributions empirically like this. Theory tells us exactly what the sampling distributions will look like. And you'll see more details about this in the textbook. In brief, the theory tells us that if we take enough samples, the sample proportions will be normally distributed. They'll be centered around 0.8, and the bigger the sample is, the more tightly the sample proportions will cluster around the population proportion. Just a bit of terminology here. The, the spread or the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is known as the standard error. Okay, so in the example we've just been looking at, the sampling distribution looks like this. The sample proportions will be centered around 0.8 and they'll follow a normal curve, some will be below 0.8, some will, will, some will be above 0.8. Clearly a sample with a proportion of 0.6 doesn't look like it fits with this distribution. But what about a sample with a proportion of 0.66? So here's 0.66 on our scale. Does that look like it fits with the distribution? It's getting a bit more difficult to tell. What are we going to call unlikely here? How are we going to decide whether a sample proportion looks like it fits with our sampling distribution or not. So what we're going to do is use the information that we have about the normal distribution. 
So remember with a normal distribution, 95% of values fall within two standard deviations of the mean. And any score that's more than two standard deviations away from the mean, we refer to as being unusual or unlikely. So we'll use that theory on our sampling distribution. 95% of values in our sampling distribution will fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So between about 0.69 and 0.91. Any value that falls outside that range we're going to call unusual or unlikely. So 0.66 falls around about here on the graph. That means it falls in the unlikely region. And if we had a sample proportion of 0.66, we would say we had enough evidence to convince us that the proportion of mobile phones with an MP3 player in Jamaica is less than 0.8. Now this all relates to the binomial test. The binomial test actually works out the probabilities in the tail ends of, those, of that distribution. If there was no bias in our sample, then we can be pretty confident that the sample was not taken from a population with a proportion of 0.8, that the population proportion in Jamaica is less than 0.8. So this 0 0.001, the p-value is consistent with the fact that our sample proportion 0.6 falls outside the likely region in our sampling distribution. Now we'd like to take this a little bit further. If the proportion of Jamaican mobile phones with an mp3 player is less than 0.8, I'd like a bit more information. Just how small do I think that percentage might be? What proportion of Jamaican mobile phones do have an mp3 player? So let's have a look at our sampling distribution again. We can see here, this is our sampling distribution, it's centered around 0.8, and we can see that 0.6 is quite clearly outside of the likely region in this sampling distribution. So a sample proportion of 0.6 is not consistent with a population where the proportion is 0.8. But let's see what happens if we move our sampling distribution around a little bit. What about if we move it downwards and we look at the sampling distribution for a proportion of say 0.75. So if in the population the proportion was 0.75, a sample of 0.6 would still not be consistent with that population. Let's try another one. Let's move it even further down. Let's suppose we had a population where the proportion was 0.56, then a sample of 0.6 would be totally consistent with that population. So maybe our sample with a proportion of 0.6 is coming from a population where the proportion is 0.56. Or maybe it's coming from a population where the proportion is around about 0.73. Or at the other extreme, if we move our population over to a proportion of 0.46, again, this sample of 0.6 is consistent with that population. So there's a whole range of different populations that our sample, where the proportion is 0.6, might be consistent. And that's where our 95% confidence interval comes in. Our sample proportion of 0.6 is quite consistent with populations that have proportions anywhere from 0.46 to 0.74. Now, these ideas of the sampling distribution apply equally well to the sample mean for metric data as they do for the sample proportion in categorical data. And you can also set up sampling distributions for the sample mean. And there are a lot of examples of that in the textbook. So it would be a good idea to read through those sections to see what the sampling distribution looks like for the sample mean. So what you should do this week you should read through modules 3.1 to 3.4. You should try the three sampling simulations or watch the videos and you'll find those on Blackboard. And you should complete Topic Test 4. This has been a Swinburne production.